Good morning, everyone. I think we should begin. Uh, welcome to the database launch for the CJR seed product market segment database. And so this is the culmination of years of data um, gathering and analysis, and a portion of it is now visualized and can be used um, to generate reports that can help us uh, guide breeding investments. And today's session, we're going to launch this database. And we're also going to learn a little bit about how it can be used to understand and to sharpen those investments. Um, we think it's a really great asset, uh, and we're very excited to debut it for you today. Uh, the, a quick look at the agenda today. We have a 50-minute session. We'll try not to go over by much. Um, we'll have a quick opening remarks from Gary Atlin from the Gates Foundation, then an overview of the history and how it was built, the database, by Peter Cole Drake. Then we'll have a demonstration session by Agnes Gatonga, who will walk you through uh, some of the queries and how you might handle those if you're using the database. And then a look at what's next as we pass this along to the accelerated breeding and um, uh, market intelligence, intelligence initiatives. As much of the initial work was done by um, Excellence in Breeding, the platform that is slowly being phased out over the course of this year. So with that, um, I would like to turn it over to Gary Atlin, who is with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who has been a great supporter of all of EIB's work and CGI breeding work, and allow him a few minutes to talk about the big picture of what this data can mean for sharpening our investments as a CGR uh, breeding network. So Gary. Thanks very much, Adam. Um, you know, we are all very aware that that re the resources available for uh, international crop improvement are are very limited, um, and and we really uh, at at the Gates Foundation and other uh, um, other other funding organizations um, have been struggling for a long time to to. Uh, uh, be able to uh, come up with with systems for helping to allocate those resources in, in the way um, in a way that would have maximum impact on on poverty alleviation um, and uh, uh, economic development. Until the EIB began pulling together market segment information, um, and you know, uh, I'd like to express my gratitude to uh, to. Peter and and the team for really um, starting off and, and moving this uh, huge job forward uh, so well. Um, and, you know, unt until um, you began that work, there was really very little high level information uh, that we could use on the relative importance of um, the, the, and the relative importance of crops for for poverty alleviation, there there was information, but it was very high level uh, at at global or um, um, uh, regional level without any disaggregation into um, uh, market classes or production systems, um, and so it was therefore you know really hard for funders and for uh, for CGIAR research managers to make sensible data driven decisions on on uh, how to allocate their uh, their scarce resources um the the process tends tended to be done on a, a center by center basis in in a competitive manner um where uh, you know uh, centers were um uh, making the best uh, and in some cases, the loudest possible uh, uh, case for for their crops, um, and and the decisions that got made, and, and to some degree still got made, are often driven by the intersection of of the interests of of researchers and and the needs of donors um, to uh, to invest um, based on on uh, paths of least resistance in some cases and, and existing relationships. One CGIAR and the EIB uh, as as, as uh, integrating uh, uh, platforms provide an opportunity for the CG as a whole to own the resource allocation process and to present the funder community with a, a research plan that, that maximizes impact on poverty alleviation, nutrition, and, and climate adaptation. Um, th this is going to be very important for us going forward in, in really focusing 
uh, helping uh, uh, you uh, and and uh, the CGIAR to focus uh, efforts on um, the the most important problems regions and and uh, species in terms of um, uh, uh, the ability to um, uh, support uh, improved nutrition uh, adaptation to uh, rapidly changing production uh, conditions and um, uh, markets. I, I, I'd like to just note that the tool will not only be useful for breeders with, with just a little tweaking, it'll provide actionable information on the importance and potential of, uh, and vulnerability of, of cropping systems. Um, you know, and, and so it should be of interest uh, to beyond the, the uh, breeding community. Um, of course, uh, this is the beginning of an important effort. It's a big, uh, a big first step. Um, as a, a person who's uh, taken a quick look through the product, I, I hope that uh, in the in the near future we'll be able to do things like capture trends of market segment development over time. Uh, aggregate up to regions, especially to the sub-Saharan Africa level, um, express uh, yields of vegetatively propagated crops in, in terms of dry weights and all crops in terms of uh, calories and protein that they, uh, they provide. Um, and uh, I know that uh, work is progressing well to capture current levels of investment in each market segment in terms of the pipelines that are actually funded and operated by uh, by CGIA or research, allowing us uh, to, to better allocate resources, avoid uh, over and under investment. So, um, it, you know, we started really from zero uh, and uh, uh, my, um, uh, I'd just like to, to express again my great appreciation to, uh, to Peter and the team for uh, moving this along uh, and uh, getting it started. It was an immense job and the, the product looks extremely useful. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Gary. And thanks again for all your support for EIB and the initiatives over the course of the years, but also your personal insights and support for the work we've been doing. Okay, so now we'll move to the main parts of the agenda. So if I can just share my screen here. Uh, we will turn it over to Peter Coldrake, who really led a lot of this work, um, who is going to walk you through a bit of the background of how the data was gathered, analyzed, and the tool was built. So I'll turn it over to Peter. Thanks, Adam. And thanks, Gary, for those very appropriate words of introduction to this effort. But I would be remiss if I didn't say a sincere thank you to the crop leads, the breeding teams, and other teams at each center that contributed data and answered many questions that I had about the data and helped us get to where we are. But what you're seeing today wouldn't be possible without the help and, and input of Sam Storr, Adam Hunt, and Agnes Katonga in taking what was a basic Excel file and converting it to what you'll see today. So sincere thanks to everybody that's helped along the way to get us to where we are today. What I would like to do is provide some background and just give you an understanding of what we've done to this point. And as Gary mentioned, where we were at is solid foundation for us to build from. But when I initially started, the reason that I, I wanted to, to catalog and understand market segments was to be able to answer a request from the funders to develop pipeline investment cases. And pipeline investment case to me is as simple as what's the opportunity that's being addressed and how much money is being spent to address that opportunity. So to understand the opportunity, we needed to understand what market segments existed for the crops that the CG was working on and what the opportunity was in each of those market segments. So we started in 2020 and the, the efforts continued to evolve since then. Our scope was all CG centers and all crops. And the first goal we had was to identify the unique crop market segments at a one CG subregion level. Once we'd done that, our second goal was to describe the, the impact of opportunity of each of those crop market segments. So those were the two goals that we had. 
as we so next slide please Adam so starting out our first task was to define a market segment what do we mean when we say a market segment the way we define a market segment is it's a group of growers with a common variety need that's driven by consumer and processor requirements for what the crop is used for, combined with a set of grower requirements based on where and how the crop is produced. So it takes into account what do the consumers and the processors need from an ideal product, and what does the ideal product need to look like for the growers that are going to grow that in a predict particular area and using a predict particular um, crop production system. So we jump to the next slide, please. So what was done by the crop leads and the teams at, at the different centers? They identified market segments at the 1CG sub-region level. Once they'd identified those market segments, they provided us the initial description of the market segment, the countries that were in that market segment in that sub-region, the hectares that were within each country, the average yield in that market segment and the average selling price of the crop or the product that was produced in that particular market segment. Now it's key to point out that in the initial database, if two centers were working on the same crop in the same, same region, the market segment was included twice because this was needed in the original pipeline investment case where we were trying to understand what was being spent by each center on each opportunity that was in, that was in front of them. So if we move to the next slide, please. So what did we do as EIB? We consolidated the information that we received from, from the crop leads and crop teams. Then we went to FAO Stat and World Bank to get country level data to help us describe the impact or opportunity of each of the each market segment. So we, we got data like total population, rural population, number in poverty, number undernourished. And we converted that data and broke it down to the crop market segment level, country by country. And then we summed it up to get to the impact within the subregion. We also created a set of data that was specific to the actual footprint area of the market segment. So the number of hectares that the market segment comprised of, we used average rural population to calculate the number of people that were living on the hectares the market segment was grown on. And then we, we used that data then to, to understand how many of those people were undernourished or in poverty. So we have two sets of data, essentially one at the market segment level, which is a sub-region level, another set of data that's at the market segment footprint level, which is how many people are actually living on the hectares the crop is produced on. So if we move to the next slide, please. So after we got the initial input from the, the teams at each center, there wasn't a consistent approach to the naming of these market segments. Each center, each crop had their own unique way of, of naming those market segments. So what we did then is come up with a consistent approach to, to naming a market segment. We did that using crop, the 1CG region, the 1CG subregion, short description of what the crop was used for. So was it used for, for fresh consumption? Was it used in an industrial process to create starch or flour, for example? What was the color of the grain or flesh of the product? Where was the crop grown in that subregion? So how was the crop grown? So it could be, was it transplanted or was it direct seeded? Was it irrigated or was it rain fed? And then finally, the maturity of the crop. And so we used these eight criteria to consistently name market, the crop market segments across centers and across crops. We, we also compared the, the hectares across a crop in a country and in a subregion with the hectares that were available from FAO stat. And if there were obvious big differences, um, we made adjustments as needed. 
And so we tried to take what came in as sort of ad hoc from each of the centers and put it into a consistent naming format and cross check the, the, the hectares that were reported with the hectares that are available from FAO stat and just go backwards and forwards and work with, with the, the breeding teams and the centers to make sure that we really had captured the market segments the way that they, they needed to be defined. Uh, and in some cases, moving to these eight criteria caused us to identify additional market segments as we broke the original descriptions out into more detail using these eight criteria. We move to the next slide, please. So working with the, the market intelligence team and especially work package one of the market intelligence team, the criteria to identify and name a market segment have been updated. Um, this, this slide provides the details of the, the new approach. There's still eight components to the, the naming of a unique market segment. There's more detail here as providing examples within each. I'd ask that if you want this level of detail, please reach out to Jason Donovan and ask for the market intelligence brief number one, um, where, where this table is, is in a short document that gives a much more thorough description of how to identify market segments. I just want you to, to be aware that there's, there's more clarity and detail, and there is a, a short brief to the point document that can provide you everything you need to know about how to identify and name a market segment as we move forward. Next slide, please, Adam. So then when it came to the description of each market segment, um, we have you know, all the, the different descriptors that are listed here. So by getting the population and getting a, a percentage in poverty, we were able to calculate the number of people in poverty, either in the total population or the rural population. Same thing with undernourished. And then I mentioned what we did for calculation for the, the market segment footprint population. And then within that population, how many people were living in poverty or how many people were undernourished. So this is by no means an all inclusive set of descriptors. This was just what I could pull together um, as the initial step to show what could be done once we had identified unique market segments, what data could we use to describe the opportunity or impact within each of those market segments. Uh, so this is where we, we arrived for version 1.0. Um, these are all current descriptors, so it's current population. Ideally, when market intelligence hits their stride, they will have forward-looking data and will have data for 2030, 2035 for the population so we can understand what the opportunity is in the market segments for products that we're beginning to develop today. What, when they finally reach the market, what does that market segment look like in the future? So this was just an example of what we could do and, and we, we got this set of data. Uh, this is what we will report in the tool as new descriptors for each market segment are identified and broken down to the market segment level, they can be added and we can make this more robust and far more meaningful than what it is today. Next slide, please. So how have we used this seed product market segment database? We've used it to drive a common understanding and consistent communication, both of identifying and naming market segments and to start to bring a, and draw attention and focus to what's the impact and opportunity of each of those market segments that we've identified across one CG. So in one data set, we understand the market, unique market segments for each crop in each subregion, and we've named them in a consistent way and we've described them in a consistent way. So someone that's interested in, in looking at where they might prioritize or what market segments offer the, the greatest potential to have an impact on reducing poverty or reducing hunger can go to this data set and identify the key market segments that they should focus on. By identifying the, the unique market segments, it's then allowed us to develop a target product profile for each of those market segments. And a target product profile describes the ideal product that's needed for that particular market segment. And it goes down to the, to the trait level. So which traits are required in a product that would 
would meet the needs of growers, processors, and consumers for a particular market segment. So it's really allowed us to bring focus to what the, the breeding teams need to be working towards as far as a product to deliver for each of these market segments. We've then been able to align the breeding pipelines to these market segments. So we can understand the pipeline, we understand the investment that's currently being made in a pipeline, and by aligning that to market segments, we can then be, begin to calculate a pipeline investment case. So how much are we spending? And for that investment, what's the impact or the opportunity that's being addressed by the investment? And so we have generated the first version of pipeline investment cases. We continue to refine those, but at least we have something that we can start to look across and say, is the investment that's currently being made aligned appropriately with the opportunity or impact that that investment is focused on? And so it's, it's allowing us to, to ask and answer those questions across crops and across centers and see, are we making the best investment that we can? And are we having the greatest impact from that investment? So if we go to the next slide, please. So what are the next steps for this seed product market segment database? Um, we've handed it over to Market Intelligence Work Package 1, and they're continuing to update this database with segments that were overlooked in, in the initial effort. Um, so we know that there's, there's some market segments out there that weren't captured. Um, and in some cases, they, they simply weren't captured because the current breeding effort wasn't focused on them. And so we need to understand what those market segments are that exist that today we don't have a breeding effort focused on because some of those market segments may be significant and offer a large impact or opportunity if we were to invest in them. The Market Intelligence Work Package 1 group will also generate a version of this database without the duplication that, that's in the, the, the current database where we have multiple sensors working on the same market center or market segment. So you can think of a, a card of wheat and cement wheat, or in some cases working on the same market segment in the same region. Africa rice and IRI have been working on the same market segment in the same region. They're making significant strides to align the efforts across the, the race breeding teams to essentially work as one race. We'll also, in the with work package one, market intelligence gen, generate an updated version of the sub regional database files with the descriptors calculated across all seed product market segments in that sub region, not just across an individual crop in that sub region. So, in the case of, of Western Africa, I, there's 57 unique crop market segments that exist today in Western Africa. This version of the seed product market segment database will look at in Western Africa, what's the allocation of, of population across each of those unique 57 market segments. So we can really start to see now and compare across crops, which, which crop market segments are the most important in Western Africa, for example. So not just within corn, but how does corn compare to cassava, compared to beans, compared to millet, compared to sorghum? Which one of those crop market segments is the most significant in Western Africa, for instance? Then we'll get to, we'll, we'll get to um, where we identify new market segments that need to be added to this database. And here, just like with the descriptors, I think that we need the market intelligence team to be looking 10 years out and say, how, what market segments do we, do we believe will exist 10 years from now? And what will, what's the size of those market segments? And then that will allow us to adjust the, the investment today to make sure that we're, we're spending money on the crop market segment that will be, have the greatest impact 10 years from now. So we need to understand new market segments that may come into play. So uh, that's, that's a, a key effort. And then finally, the Market Intelligence Work Package 4 team is assembling more descriptors of impact and opportunity, and especially forward-looking descriptors. So they'll bring more life to this database and allow us to 
look at uh, what market segments have the, the greatest opportunity to, to react and respond to climate change that we see happening or changes in population, changes in poverty level that we project will, will occur in the future. So that's work that the Market Intelligence Work Package 4 is doing. The way I look at it is the work that EIB has done up to now has generated the foundation for the market intelligence team to take this basic effort, an initial effort, and, and continue to improve it, expand it, uh, and make it far more powerful than what it is today. But we have an initial version. We have an initial version across all centers and all crops that's allowing us to have great discussions and allowing teams to ask questions that we can use this database to, to give a data-based answer rather than an opinion-based response to those questions. So with that, I hope I've given you a back, you know, an understanding of the background, why we did what we did. And now I would like to introduce Agnes Katonga, who's worked with me through this process and is now working with Market Intelligence Work Package 1 team to continue to improve and expand what's in this market segment database. And she'll provide you a demonstration of what it is and how you can use it. And so over to you, Agnes. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Peter. And uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Peter, for sharing that detailed overview of the work, background of the work that has been done. And uh, I'll take us through uh, the database, how you'll be able to access it. Uh, first, we'll go through, uh, I believe right now, everyone from the invite that you got, you have the link to the database. And so I'll take us through the general overview of how when you get to the landing page and the various features that are there. Also, we'll go to the market segment explorer and look at the, in the, uh, at the functions that are, that are there that will enable us to navigate. Then we'll go to the queries that everyone may have as far as accessing the information, such that uh, you're able to access information on market segments, you're able to view at a regional level, you're also able to see the various uh, crops that are also serviced by more than one CG, like Peter mentioned earlier. And lastly, we'll look at how to compare the market segments according to metrics associated with it uh, uh, as far as impact is concerned. So without repeating what uh, uh, Peter has talked about, this is a general overview of all the crops and the CGs and the regions. And so what you will notice when you go to the database, uh, these are the, 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 the and you will notice uh, some of the crops, there's some overlap uh, where we have more than one CG working in a specific uh, crop. Uh, the other thing that uh, we will be working on in future is to deal away with the duplicity and Peter mentioned that. So we'll go direct to the, to the database. Uh, basically from the link that you received, uh, once you click on the, on, the, on the link, it will bring you to this landing page. And there are various things that you can uh, be able to see from this landing page. The first thing is you will see there is a video, a how-to video of how to navigate. Uh, the next thing you will see is information general. Uh, and also the methodology and uh, part of what will, would, a, a brief of what has been described already in the market uh, segment, uh, market uh, intelligence brief that, uh, Peter talked about, and basically this is more information. So what is critical when you get here to get to the database, you will click to the market segment explorer. Sorry, my, it's acting up. So you once you click here, it will take us to the market segment explorer. And uh, when you get to the market segment explorer, there are various filters uh, that are there. So on the left-hand side, on the left-hand side, we have uh, details about the various market segments, be it at regional level, uh, various, uh, various uh, CGs, and definitely all the crops. On the right-hand side is where, as we'll see uh, as we continue with the discussion, is where you can get very specific information per given market segment. So uh, 
Uh, the first filter is on crops. So here you have an option of filtering out the crop of interest. And now we are going to on how to navigate. So for example, if you want to get information uh, on beans, uh, what you would do is come to the crops. Uh, this The drop down has all the crops uh, serviced by the CG centers. So you click on the crop of interest. Then you have the centers. In this particular case, because beans is only served by SEAT, SEAT is the only CG that you will see highlighted. Uh, then you have the regions. Um, and uh, basically, you can see all the regions. However, the ones that are being served are highlighted, sort of like a darker black color. The ones that no work is being done there, then it's a lighter gray color. So for example, now we can select uh, uh, East Africa. Uh, from here, if you scroll down, you'll be able to see all the market segments in East Africa for beans that are being served by SEAT. And uh, basically from this example, uh, if you want more information as far as a specific market segment is concerned, for example, if you want more information on beans uh, for mid, uh, the, the, the medium and large seeded size, red and bottled, uh, high altitude, rain fed and climbing early, which is the second one, you will just click on this and on the, uh, on the right hand side, you see that you will get more specific information as far as that market segment is concerned. And here you can see all the countries. You can see this market sub segment. You have Burundi, Uganda, Rwanda, DRC, Tanzania, Kenya, Ethiopia. So once you click on any market segment uh, after you have filtered out, uh, then on the right hand side is when you get all the information that you would require for at uh, at a, a, a sub one CGIR sub region level. And uh, the other things that you will see also is the other metrics uh, that also Peter mentioned. For example, here you will see the, the average yield uh, of that particular market segment, the annual production, you also have the market value and definitely the other descriptors uh, as far as um, uh, uh, population is concerned. So in this particular case, you will see total population, rural population and uh, market segment footprint. So on the first column is where you have total population. And for that total population, you'll have total population. Uh, then you'll have total rural population in light green. And the orange will be the total uh, population footprint. The next column is on the uh, population living in poverty. And the next one is on population undernourished. So in case you would like to get more information as far as uh, 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 a market segment that is being served by more than one CG. Uh, that's the next query that uh, one may ask. So anytime you want to go back, you reset, you click on the reset button, then it goes back on reset. And there you're given another option to actually filter out what you'd like. So in this particular case, I'll give an example of a crop like, um, uh, wheat, uh, spring wheat, which has more than one CG serving. So we we will go to wheat. Uh, when it comes to all centers, you will see here now you have Simit and Ikada serving more than uh, serving that particular crop. And so if you scroll down uh, in terms of uh, uh, the market segments, for example, uh, you can see that uh, this, this, this first market segment is served by CIMIT, the next one is served by ICADA, the next CIMIT, the next CIMIT, and you can see basically you have a view that has both CGs. And that's what Peter was talking about in terms of market segments that are being served or crops that are being served by, by more than one CG. And for you to be able to really have a very specific view, if for example, you want to look at uh, market sub, uh, segments served by, by CIMIT, then what you do is just filter out. And if you scroll down now, you can see all the market segments here, you can see submitted by CIMIT, submitted by CIMIT. So you've been able to filter out the market segments that are served by ICADA. And then thereafter, you can be able now to again come here and 
uh, filter out the, the, the region or the subregion of interest. Now, the other question that may come up as you're interacting with this information is, we have various metrics that uh, help us to define the potential associated with that particular, the impact potential associated with that particular market segment. And so in this sort filter that is here, the default is to have the acreage, but we have the other descriptors, uh, the, the population and poverty, population undernourished, total population, rural population. And in this filter, one is able to come here and really filter out what you want to, uh, to, to look at. For example, if population, total population is something that is very specific to a given market segment, uh, you would want to use that as a, a decision point, then you would just come here uh, and filter out uh, uh, the, the, the total population. And you can see now in this particular example, you can see in East Africa, the population uh, for, for the first market segment, you have 240 million uh, uh, number of people. So if that's a determinant as far as uh, decision making is concerned, then you can look at, you can scroll down and see the other market segment and really be able to narrow down which market segment do you want to focus on. And uh, if you need more details again about that uh, market segment, the next thing would be uh, like we had highlighted earlier, just go and uh, scroll and, uh, and, uh, and click on the market segment that you're interested in. And on the right hand side, you will get the details. For example, for spring wheat, uh, East Africa, uh, for processing white, heat stressed, rain fed, and mid maturing, you can see now this one. We have two countries, which is Kenya and Tanzania. And you can see the other metrics are also demonstrated there. Uh, there's also we do have also uh, some market segments that are being serviced by more than two uh, uh, CG centers. For example, an example that had been given by Peter Alia would be rice. So we can reset this and go back and scroll on rice. So for rice, you will find out that uh, we have more than one, uh, we have more than two CGs that are serving rice. We have Africa rice, we have Siat, and we have Iri. So again, based on your interest, you, you, you will be able to fil filter out, uh, for example, a region, let's say East Africa. And in East Africa, you will see again, there are two uh, institutes that are serving, that is Africa rice, and you have Iri. Then again, you can always filter out uh, the, the, the specific uh, uh, center you're interested to see the data. And again, you're able to see all the information uh, for East Africa. You can see all the market segments. And uh, if uh, you're interested, for example, to see the population that is undernourished as a comparison to see which market segment would be of, uh, would be of priority based on uh, the objectives of a, a given breeding program, for example, you can uh, click on the undernourished. And this gives you now of all the market segments in East Africa for rice, uh, this is the overview and you're able now to do the comparison. And lastly, you're also able to, again, narrow down and see which countries are served in that particular market segment. I'll end there. And as Gary mentioned, uh, this is the first step and we are committed and looking forward to see continuous improvement of this database. And now I'll hand over to Jason who will take us through the next steps. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Agnes. Thank you, Agnes. So um, in Peter's Peter's last slide, uh, Peter mentioned the way forward in broad strokes. He mentioned work by work package one, which is market intelligence, and work by work package four, which is pipeline investment cases. I'm going to talk in these next few slides with a focus on work package one, which is market intelligence. Work package one includes about 40 researchers, seed system specialists, social scientists, um, gender experts, um, food technologists, breeders. Um, across six centers, external partners include CRAD and World Vegetable Center, as well as NARS. So one of the, now in terms of way forward for work package one, um, a, a, an immediate sort of an obvious step we need to do is to clear up 
any sort of missing missing components. I mean, Peter presented the eight segmentation criteria. Some of those uh, components or those criterion are missing, um, and we need to fix those, as well as we've got some questionable components, and I'll explain what those are in a second. Uh, we've got, if you look at the list, the table on the right, uh, you'll see the list of missing components. This We're down to 24. Uh, I think when Agnes, Peter, and I started looking, started trying, trying to whittle that number down several months ago, it was 60, 80, 90. Um, so we're down to 24. We're going to need some market intelligence to sort this out. Basically, we've gotten as far as we can through the interactions that Peter described. Um, we've got some questionable components. Those total, those are bit more, total 51 across a number of crops. So to give you an idea of what I mean, um, if you look at fava beans, um, they're not a hybrid. Eastern Africa, they're, it's for food, medium size, but we don't, we don't know the color. Uh, we don't know whether we're talking green, yellow, purple, um, black, brown, fava beans. So anyway, we'll sort that out. In potatoes, we've got potatoes, not hybrid. Uh, Southern Asia is for food, uh, table potatoes, yellow flesh. We've got three growing regions uh, mixed together. So we've got subtropical, tropical, lowlands, highlands. Odds are that it's not one ideal product that serves all three of these growing regions. And so we'll be looking to sort that out as we move ahead. A similar questionable component for beans, um, uh, in terms of color, we've got red, black, and white mixed together for Latin America, and we'll be working with uh, uh, CIAT to sort that out. Next slide, please, Adam. Now, zooming out a bit, um, in terms of a, a sort of a research agenda, what is the research we're looking to do around sort of to, to refine and expand and to build new databases for future market segments? Um, this slide gives you some idea of what we're looking at. So we know there are large segments out there that just aren't in the database. So fragrant rice is one, OPV in East Africa is one. At the same time, there's also segments which are which exist, but which aren't recognized in the database and which really aren't on anyone's radar. To identify these segments requires some, some special methods, innovative methods. Uh, we're working with our team to design those methods. Um, and we've already come up with some examples of unrecognized segments. So by unrecognized, I do mean that the need, the need is now. And in some cases, there's even product available, just not by CGIR um, our, and partners. So examples are intercropping maize in Kenya, early maturity maize in Uganda. Now, a key task for us as we move ahead will be um, identifying those future segments. So what are the changes needed in the, or what changes will take place in the context, whether that's market context, the, the, the climate context, and what does that mean for needs of uh, farmers, processors, and consumers um, in the future? And one clear example of a question we're looking to move on now is at what point might sorghum start to replace maize in East Africa and in West and Central Africa? We need, we're looking also to expand the crops in the database. So we'll be working with World Vegetable Center to include vegetables, in particular tomatoes and bell peppers in the database with the focus on Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. So that work is starting next month. Um, it will, there's some, as hinted to before, there's some, there's some unknowns in the current segmentation, um, you know, in some discussions where we, we've gotten about as far as we can through interactions uh, with breeding teams and centers. So one example is cassava. Um, are, you know, do we need to separate out cassava segments based on in use? So that's the Gary, that's the Gary versus Fufu discussion. We'll be working to sort that out. Um, and also you know, the other thing that I think is really important for work package one as we move ahead, we'll be supporting discussions on where to invest in the future, um, which segments are likely to grow. Uh, and what are emerging uses of products? So for example, the use of cassava leaf for fodder for protein extraction. So if we, ne next slide, please, Adam. We can also look at this from a crop perspective um, in terms of defining the, the research that will help us to refine, expand the, the database. Uh, some, some crop specific questions we're looking at. So if you look at maize, um, both in Latin America and in Eastern, Southern, in Eastern Africa, we're looking at the growth of the poultry industry and what does that mean for maize breeding uh, with a strong focus on 10, 20 years into the future. Um, market segments for OPVs in West Africa is another thing we'll be working with IITA to sort out. 
when we look at millet, um, we're, one of the questions we're working on now is what is the potential demand for non-rancidity properties in millet? This is a step change in breeding that is technology is there. We're, we'll be working with stakeholders in Burkina Faso and other places to understand what that potential is in terms of potential benefits. For wheat, we're working, um, we'll be working with ACARDA and CIMIT to figure out what are farmers' needs for seed products beyond disease and pest resistance. And we're also working on the ground now in Tanzania to understand farmers' preferences for uh, product concepts for ground in Tanzania. So these, this would be product concepts would be look would be an, an effort to rec identify unrec unrecognized needs for ground nut in, um, in in Tanzania. Next slide, please, Adam. One of the big uh, to move ahead uh, on the on this agenda, we're going to need some new methods, and we'll be working with the team to to think about, to discuss, and to test new methods. And one of them, we'll be looking at methods that take two different approaches. So one is uh, the bottom up approach, where we look at what's where we talk to we talk to stakeholders, whether they're growers, processors, and consumers, and try to figure out their needs now and in the future. Um, that's an important part of what we do, but we're also equally interested um, in the top-down approach where we look at changes in context, anticipate changes in context, make, make clear assumptions and what that means uh, for stakeholders. And that's taking into account issues such around labor access, uh, climate change, access to resources such as water. Um, next slide, please, Adam. So let me just wrap up here. Um, I've tried to give you an idea of how we'll take this forward with a, a larger team still engaging closely with Peter Agnes, who is part of the team. And um, we, in, in short, we're looking as we move ahead um, to have a market view on current segment, the current reality, as close as we can get it. Um, that's sort of feasible, that's within within our means. And we're up, but we're also, I think, equally important. We're looking to create, to build discussions on what those future market segments are, um, what those, what will, what will be the drivers of these of needs, um, and what that means for better decision making um, of of the scarce resources that we have for for breeding. So, um, Adam, that's the conclusion here. Um, over to you now for for discussion. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Jason. Um, if someone does have a question they would ask to have, uh, would like to ask live, please put up your hand. Um, oh, we do have one hand up now. Um, but I can't determine who that is from my uh, participant list. Um, oh, it's gone. Um, okay, we have a couple of questions in the chat, so let's start with those. Um, so we have one from uh, Stefan who says, how much will change in climate and the related requirements be reflected in the market segments, as well as shocks that may on short term influence agri-food systems and what markets may demand? So I'm not sure who will take that, but please unmute if you can uh, handle that question. <laughs> okay. And if you need further details on how to understand the question, I'm happy to be in there. Jason, would you like to answer? Yeah, I was I was sort of thinking through uh, Stefan. So I don't, I'm not sure if I can fully, fully, fully capture that. I mean, I, I think we that's when we talk about future market segments, that's those are the and that's an effort to, I think, to address some of the issues that that you're raising. Um, we're looking to work with climate specialists, uh, GIS mm -hmm. specialists, um, and to try to advance that discussion. That's definitely on our agenda um so we'll be would certainly appreciate um your your sort of inputs there and your any ideas you may have but that's where we're looking to go um mm -hmm. yep yeah because situations may change and it may change much more rapidly than you can actually analyze the data and set market segments and set uh, breeding priorities and even if they look, if some of those changes may look short term induced by shocks, they have long term eventually sort of uh, impacts on where we need to orient ourselves on. So, yeah, very happy to have a continued conversation on that topic also for what does that mean for other value chain actors. Okay, thank you for the question and, and for the response, Jason. Um, Graham Thiel has his hand up. Graham, would you like to ask your question? Yes, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, I put the question in the chat as well. It's around um, addressing vitamin A deficiencies. In the case of some crops, 
that's really important. It isn't just uh, the, the, re the reduction of burden of hunger measures in dailies. It's specifically the, re the dailies that could be saved by having a, a biofortified crop. In the case of sweet potato, we did some ex ante analysis. And the value of the market segment, when you consider the potential reduction or, or addressing vitamin A deficiency among, amongst the targeted population, was about three times the market value of that sweet potato. So in the case of biofortified crops, it could potentially be a big difference. Um, but just to say, I know you're doing a great job here. It's very impressive. And I'm sure you'll get to these other, uh, other important things. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Graham. I, the, the first step to me is to, to identify the market segments, right? The second step then is to describe them. And the, the micronutrient deficiency market segment by market segment is clearly one descriptor that we need to generate and we need to look at it, right? And so I think what we've got is the foundation that we build on. And it's input like, like you know, what you've given, what Stefan's given, that will, will allow us to make this better, right? But we were at a point where we thought it's worth letting folks know we have this and letting folks be, be you know, thinking about it and saying, how do we improve it, right? And both of you have offered very strong um, thoughts on what we could do to make this a more powerful and more useful database. So that's the work that market intelligence team is, is going to do as we move forward. So thanks, keep, Peter. Yes, it's looking good. Quite looks this, quite user friendly, yeah. very useful. Great stuff. Thank you. Keep the suggestions coming, please. Exactly. And that's okay. why the first hand that you thought that you have seen was actually that clapping. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we're a little bit over time, but I think we have time for one last question. It looks like um, Vivian Polar, your hand is up. Would you like to ask your question, Vivian? Thanks, Adam. Um, actually, it was not a question. It was a, a comment in response to Graham and, and uh, Stefan's points. Uh, like uh, Peter rightly mentioned, uh, they were in a, a moment in time when they wanted to develop the segmentation process. We're taking uh, this process forward with market intelligence a couple of uh, steps ahead. And uh, what we are doing there is engaging with a set of teams on key specific impact areas like climate change, right, nutrition, development, developing teams around, um, around those topics and identifying key indicators that be, will be useful to assess both market segments and uh, target product profiles in the future. And so the issues of going in depth into the dailies and, and their potential, we are under discussion on that point. And also we will reach out to you, Stefan, uh, for more conversations around uh, future climate elements and how we could um, include more variables there to analyze the market segment. That's all, thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Vivian. Um, so we have reached our time for today. Um, I hope you found this to be a really useful session and you visit the uh, database on the Excellence of Reading website, but also on the, there's a link on the event page on cgr.org. Um, so I would like to congratulate the team for launching this and thank everyone at Excellence in Breeding, Market Intelligence, Accelerated Breeding, who have put all the work into this uh, this work, this database, as well as the donors who have supported us and the crop leads who helped so much uh, in gathering the data. And uh, I hope you will use this tool and I hope it's as, as useful as uh, we think it will be. And otherwise, I would like to wish everyone a good day or evening, and thank you very much for joining us today. Okay, thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.